I'm confused. <laughs> no, serious, I'm confused. What, what, what hard copy are we talking about? Why would you want to do that? <laughs> no one does that. Well, the instructions were clear. Eh? I thought at least. Are there any questions, right, with regards to what we did on uh, Sunday? Now, I have to apologize again. Uh, so for those of us that went around, something unexpected happened, on, which is very unusual, right, happened on Sunday. Came to campus early and then realized that I forgot the keys. So I had to go back home and we started class, uh, I think 30 minutes late. I apologize for that, I suppose. Ah, cluster of pipe. No questions? Uh, so one's compliment, you know, addition is, uh, is clear, right? Conversion from um, binary version of like one's or two's, two's complement to decimal, that's fine? No. The other way around, actually. Thank you. Yeah, so that it trusts properly. I, th I think it's making sense. I think it's making sense. Hmm? Sorry? Yes, so. <laughs> you guess so. <laughs> okay. I, th I thought it's like one of those binary, binary kind of responses. It's yes or no, one or one or zero or something. See that it's making sense or it's not. Are there still things that uh, we don't know that we don't know, or, or that's that's done now? No. So someone, someone, someone raised a very interesting issue on Sunday, right? We were asking if uh, there were any concerns and queries, and these are the keys I forgot actually. And oh, put them in my pocket. And he's. They said, yes, uh, that they didn't know what they didn't know, right? So it was hard for them to tell us what sort of help they would need. But hopefully, hopefully they know what they, they didn't know now, no? No. Okay, no answer. I guess so. Have you done? What are you doing? You're supposed to raise it up. Somewhere. Play around with this. Thank you. How's the quiz, by the way? Sorry? I hope no one cheated because uh, it's very easy to tell if someone has cheated and you get a zero. Right? You shall get a zero if you cheated.
What are you doing? Hmm? But why can't we see what we need to see? So don't blame me for what's happening. I don't know what uh, what Kawi did there. It's, we can't see, but yeah, it's you. I thought we discussed input output a long time ago when we were looking at peripheral devices. Um, there's a way of scanning, by the way, somewhere here. Kind of like it's fine, it works, but you just want to move the knob so that it's clear. We aren't adjusting no. Okay, so if there are no questions, then... So if there are no questions, then we, we proceed from where we left off. Uh, we, we, we started our discussion of, uh, we started our discussion of, uh, of how textual content is represented by computers, and we realized that, oh, there we go. And we actually got, got to realize that uh, there's a very interesting technique that's used, right? So there's a, usually there's a direct mapping between the characters that we, we use to form these strings that make up our textual content. So they're mapped onto equivalent binary numbers, right? Excuse me, can we pay attention please? Binary numbers so that the computer is able to understand, right? Uh, but before we continue, I wanted to point out a couple of things here, right? I, I was surprised that uh, only, only 48 people submitted their assignment. Now, I have no idea what the others um, were doing. But I just wanted to remind you that, that this thing is not a joke, right? The implications. If you miss an assessment, you're just shooting yourself, right? In the head, not in the foot, actually, in the head. There's a likelihood of failing actually high if you miss out on assessments. Especially the take, take home, especially the take home assessments, because these are free marks, right? You have more than enough time to even do a little bit of research to make sure that you submit the correct solutions. But what do you do? You instead choose not to submit. Why? It's like about 11 people that didn't submit uh, quiz number 12. Well, I guess it's 12 minus the two that don't have access to the Moodle, so um, I don't know what's happening here. But I just thought I'd point out that you know, you're just uh, disadvantaging yourself if you, if you don't work towards these things, right? they account towards the exam. Uh, if you don't pass the CA, you don't write the exam. If you get a low score in the CA, what that means is that you have to work extra hard so that you get um, a significantly higher score that's going to complement the shortfall from the CA in the final exam, which is much harder, it turns out. Right? Anyway, um, so in terms of uh, uh, things that we are we're doing here, quiz number 13 on Friday, bright and airy. It's gonna be based on still 17, but you notice that 17 is composed of a number of things that we did. Uh, so we, like, uh, quiz number 12 had some aspects of number systems, but 
But uh, 17 is going to have, I think, addition, multiplication, division, and all these ones complement, twos complement things, right? So make sure you study for that. Um, and then after next week, we have the test, right? It's on the 23rd, apparently. Um, the venue is most likely going to be ORE, but we'll split ourselves up so that, uh, you know, we have enough space to write. Usually people have been complaining that there's no space. Um, and then, again, I want to ask if there are any issues here, especially with regards to the tutorial sessions. Are things okay there? No complaints? Okay. Uh, nothing to do with the content so far, hopefully. No, thanks. All right, so we, we actually even went through an example where we, we were trying to see how a computer would actually represent this. And it turns out, right, that what a computer would see, while, while we see ICT space 1110, the computer sees a continuous stream of these ones and zeros, right, to be able to interpret what ICT 1110 is. Um, uh, and then we, we were just trying to kind of like link what, what we did before to highlight the fact that seeing as each character is equal to one byte, and we have eight characters here, then goes without saying that the total size of the file must be eight bytes, which is why we see the eight here, right? Um, we also mentioned that uh, really whilst our focus was on, on the ASCII encoding scheme, it turns out that there are a number of other encoding schemes. Um, uh, and Unicode happen, happens to be one of those uh, widely used encoding schemes just because of the sheer number of, of, of um, symbols that it's, a, it's able to accommodate. Uh, and then, oh wow, we did that. We gave people homework, hopefully people have, have looked at this. I don't know how many have done this, but anyone found a solution as to why UTF-8 is popular in comparison to the other encoding schemes? I'm student today. Fine, no one. All right, so we proceed with, with color encoding, right? Now that we know how text is represented, um, question is what about these other you know, primitive data that we tend to work with? So colors, images, video, and sound, right? So we start with color. If you think about it, there's, there's actually a number of different ways in which color can be represented. Um, and it depends on what sort of color scheme you want to, you want to play around with. And I, I have to apologize because these, these two colors don't seem, don't seem like they are different, but it turns out that they're different. So the first one uses a one bit representation. So this is your classic black and white, right? Where the, the picture that you get to see is just either patches of black or white, right? But if you're, if you're looking at, at trying to ensure that you you, you present a much clearer image, you can perhaps opt to, to use um, grayscale instead of black and white, right? So uh, you are no longer dealing with either black and white, but you could have shades of gray, right? Somewhere within, within the color itself. Um, and then finally, the most popular way of representing colors is a, a so-called uh, true color scheme where you, you use a combination of um, red, green, and blue. Um, right. So if we were to go, if you, if we were to go through the, these these three different ways of representing colors, it turns out there's more, but these are the most common ones that you come across. You realize that you can you can easily derive the total number of colors that you. Um, that you have access to depending on the type of bit representation you're using, right? Going back to our formula of uh, the different number of combinations that you'd have using this two, we know that it's just two raised to the bit representation, the, uh, two raised to the power of the bit representation. So when you're using one bit representation, you know that you're going to have two to the power one, which is just two colors, right? So it's either you have a color represented by a zero or a one, right? Um, and usually when using this, this sort of black and white, um, one bit monochrome presentation, uh, the black is represented by the zero and then the white is represented by the one, right? Um, same technique really can be used for, for grayscale. So usually this would be like a, um, 
uses 8-bit representation, but the, the number of bits that you, you are associating to four, six, seven, eight. The, the number of bits that, depending on the combination of the, 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 the placeholders here in these eight bits, you either end up with um, a much darker shade of gray or a much lighter sh shade of gray, right? Um, of course, same as, as the monochrome presentation, the, the, first, the first color is obviously going to be black, right? And the last color, this is zero, the last color, which is 255, is going to be white. Everything in between is just a shade of gray. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and and we, are getting, we are getting this range of numbers that represent the colors by just raising two to the power eight because we're saying we're using eight-bit representation. Right, so depending on the color scheme, and really if you look up online, you probably find um, color pickers associated with uh, grayscale that you can use to, to try and figure out um, what, sh what shade of gray would be represented by this two, four, six, eight, by this number here. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, you're moving from a much darker, because if this is black and this is white, you're moving from a much darker sh shade of gray to a much lighter one. I guess to a certain extent, things get a little more interesting when you're using um, so-called true color representation. Um, what happens here is you, you derive your color by, this is the most widely used technique, by the way. You derive your color by combining red, uh, green, and blue, RGB. And it turns out that the, the color spectrum that results from combining red, green, and blue um, is one that our eyes is able to perceive, right? Uh, but interestingly enough, really, you realize that if you raise, so again here we are just assuming each color is represented by eight bits, which means we have a total of eight plus eight plus eight, which is 24 bits, right? So your, your so-called true color that uses um, RGB to represent a color, if you use eight bit representation, results in two to the power 24 number of colors, right? Which is like almost 16 million colors approximately, right? a lot of them. Um, and usually, uh, this, this is more or less like a color scheme that is used for um, most of the data that we work with on our computers these days, right? Um, yeah, so, sad that the picture is not very clear here, but this is in true color presentation here. All right, so, but, is this, is this image? Okay, okay, so that now that we're done with uh, color encoding, right? you realize that we can take advantage of how we represent colors here, right? Whether we are using uh, one-bit monochrome or um, grayscale using eight-bit representation, or if we decide to go with a true color representation, which uses a combination of red, green, um, and blue, right? Shades of red, green, and blue, or different intensities of red, green, and blue, you realize that then we, we get to understand exactly how images can actually be presented by the computer, right? Um, so typically, uh, the way an image on our computer is represented is by, by really making use of the um, pixels that are associated to the screen that you're using, right? So uh, if you have your phone or your computer, what you're seeing on the screen is actually just uh, a series of pixels, right? Millions of them. Uh, and depending on which color scheme you're using, um, those pixels will have a range of color intensity. So if we are using, if we are using, uh, if we are using one chrome, is it one, one bit monochrome presentation, this is what we would have, right? So uh, the top example here, I'm just showing us that uh, we could, we could literally represent ICT 11, 10 using one bit monochrome, right? By just um, saying everywhere where we have a zero, it's going to be a black, wherever we have a white, a pixel that has a, a one, a value of one is going to be a white, right? Uh, so then you know that you can easily write your ICT 1110. Okay. Um, the same goes for, uh, if, if you're using RGB, the only difference with one from, uh, the, the only difference from, the only difference between this and that is that um, the color intensities that we're working with here are slightly more. So 
in here, in this example, we're only working with two colors. But in this particular image, we're working with 16 million 700, or is it 16 million 777,216 colors, right? Which is why we're able to, to come up with something like that, right? Um, and really, a, a pixel is nothing more than um, a dot. If you zoom in into an image, you, you actually, you can actually see the, the image pixelate, you can see the individual pixels and the colors associated to, to that image. I don't know if people have tried to kind of like uh, play around with any sort of application software that, uh, like Photoshop. Right? When, as you are zooming in into an image, depending on the quality or the resolution of the image, you notice that it becomes less clear, right? Um, you start seeing the actual individual pixels, which is these things here. Right. Uh, so this small little box here, this box here, this box here, in this case, we either have a value of zero or one. For uh, one for white and zero for black. Um, so the same, same thing is happening here um, with an image that um, uses um, RGB color scheme. Um, each particular pixel will either be a combination of the 16 million colors we're talking about here. Right. And which is why, by the way, if when you are when you are when you are purchasing. When you, you, I don't know if people have paid particular attention to this, but when, when you, oh, I don't know if people have paid particular attention to this, but when you, you are buying a phone, one of the specifications, uh, one of the things that are specified are what? Uh, the resolution, right? So I think this, this phone is marketed as being, well, I've actually forgotten what it's marketed as, uh, but it's probably like 1,000 1, and, I don't know, 1,000 something by God knows what, right? So. It tells you, it tells you the number of pixels that you can, the number of pixels that can be laid on the screen horizontally, right? X times Y or N times uh, P or something, and the number of pixels that can be laid out uh, vertically, right? So when you multiply the number of pixels that appear um, in your width by the number of pixels that would appear as the height, you come up with a relative number that represents the number of pixels that um, help present an image on your screen, right? Um, and in fact, uh, so if you have a phone that, um, if, if you have a phone that has a much bigger form factor like this one, I don't know if these are the same, I guess. If you have like one of those uh, iPads or whatever, is it an iPad, I don't know what they call them. Um, the, the things that you see are much clearer than the things that you'd see here, right? Because of the number of pixels that you have access to. Picture quality is dependent on the number of pixels. On the resolution, yeah, the number of pixels, yes, of course. Right. Okay. This is, I mean, this is like, I guess this is uh, self-explanatory, simple stuff, right? Um, I guess, simple stuff. Um, so what you can do, though, is, um, this is almost already done here. What, what you can do really, if you are, you are trying to, uh, I don't know what I was trying to do here. If you're trying to get a sense of the, the way that a computer perceives an image, again, you can use some, a, a hex dump like Octeta here. So you open up your, your image, see it's a .j, .jpg file here, and you realize that you can see the, the um, what do you call this? The, not everything actually. Typically the, the first part of the, the first series of bits represent the metadata associated with the image. But after you present the metadata, what you have is a series of ones and zeros that corresponds to the different color schemes. In this case, the 16 million potential colors that can be associated with the image, right? Um, and you notice that an application like, like Photoshop, for instance, will be able to render your image without a problem. Because all a computer does is, the, the computer doesn't see spaces, right? It's a continuous stream of bits. So it knows that after I read uh, the bits that represent the metadata, everything that comes after that are the colors that are going to be laid on the screen left to right, right? Continuously. In chunks of 24. Right? Um, and then boom, you see something, something like this here. 
Is this making sense? How many bits? How many bits represent this here? But you said you are following, right? Okay. <laughs> like, here's a question: How many bits? If this if this uses RGB, uh, like three RGB channels, how many bits are used to render this hair follicle? For I don't know who this is. Who is this? I don't know. But how many bits are used here? Sorry? <laughs> 16 something? I don't know what that, that something is. The question is, if we're saying this image that you're looking at as an example here, this, um, this is being rendered using um, the RGB color channel using eight, um, well, color depth is eight bits here. Well, sorry, 24 bits. And I've given away the answer, shit. But it's, the answer is 24. The question was, for each of these individual pixels, how many bits are we using to represent each one of them? Yes, 24, right? And really the 24, right, the way it's laid out is it follows the same order, RGB, um, red, green, and blue. So the first, the first eight bits represent um, the scheme associated with the blue. The next eight will represent uh, the green. And then the last eight will represent uh, the blue. Uh, and then when you mix the three, you come up with the color that you are looking for. So if you mix, so if you mix, uh, if you mix, sometimes the RGB thing will be represented by, like this, right? So if you were to mix this, what color is, would this be? Sorry? Yeah, it's blue. Maybe we shouldn't ask questions because people are just sitting. It's RGB, right? RGB. Like, I mean, so if we say that the range of colors represented by each one of these ranges from, this is zero to, eight bits, eight bits, eight bits. Zero to 255, zero to 255, zero to 255. If the last one is 255, and this is represented by blue, then you know this is a blue. Um, nothing coming from uh, green, nothing coming from red. So what you're mixing is, Nothing red, nothing green, but all of blue, which is just blue. <laughs> um, if you, things are not making sense, why don't you ask? And you're saying, oh, this one is clicking now. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's a simple, really, it's quite simple, really, if you think about it. What color would we be representing here? But there's no color called red and green. What are you talking about? Orange. Well, I, I don't know. I've forgotten. I don't, I don't know which grade we're doing this. But anyway, I'm, I'm paused here because I'm, I want this to sink in. Yes. Okay. And by the way, in case people are wondering, no one is going to ask you in the exam, say, what color is this? Nobody does that. I'm just saying, no one. I, I think they asked this in, in grade two or something, right? When we're mixing colors with crayons and people have forgotten. And by the way, right, this, the way these colors work, they, they're called, so they're called additive colors because uh, normally if you get paint, if you go to, I don't know, deco or something and, and go and buy paint, green, blue, and red, green, and blue, and you mix the paint, you won't come up with uh, the results that we're describing here. These are additive colors, meaning that when we mix them together, we derive a new color, right? Again, if you are wanting to play around with different colors, what you can do is you can really install any sort of application you wish to use. I use GIMP myself, which is the equivalent of, I guess, Photoshop somehow. And you notice that I have this kind of like color picker I don't know if I can zoom in here, I wish I could. Um, probably not. But I have this color picker and uh, forget the hue, the saturation, and I uh, don't know what this is. Just pay particular attention to what's happening to the red and green here. So if I said I want to combine uh, 255 of red and 255 of, uh, uh, of green, and they lied, right? It's yellow. 
right? So the sorry, yeah, but well, I don't know. But this, so this is yellow, but it doesn't matter. No, it's not an exam. This is yellow, right? So if you want to understand this more, you can just is there any, I guess, um, application software used for manipulating images, and you'll be able to do this, able to figure out what's happening behind the scenes here. Uh, 255 all the way results into boom, white, right? When you combine red, green, and blue, if you have 255, 255, and 255, it's white. Because what, what you have when you say it's 255, 255, 255 is a continuous stream of ones, 24 of them. And we said that the, the color moves from zero is black, the last color is white. Same for one bit monochrome, um, the monochrome color palette. All right, hope that makes sense. So I mean, if you're curious to see how your image looks like, I mean, you can just open it using any hex dump application, like Octet or something. Um, and, and then you notice really that uh, if you kind of really think about this, if we're saying we have an image that's represented um, using a predefined resolution, right? Uh, the width times the height tells you the total number of pixels that you have on your screen, right, or on your image. If this was an image, we're saying if we multiply, if we multiply the resolution, uh, the width and the height, usually just think of the resolution as being the width and the height, right, number of pixels horizontally times the number of pixels vertically, you realize that we'll come up with the total number of pixels here. Now, if we have the total number of pixels and we know exactly what sort of bit, color depth we are using to represent the image, like whether it's one bit monochrome um, or eight bit grayscale or 24 bit true color, then we can compute the total size of the image. Do you understand? We can, by multiplying the number of, by computing the total number of bits that are going to be um, used to present the picture, times the bit depth, which is a, uh, the uh, kind of like a, how, how many bits are associated for each particular pixel, they, we can compute the total size, the theoretical size of the image. The width times the height times the color depth will give you the total size of the image. Does, does this make sense? Yes. Come again, are, are they what? The pixels that we're talking about. Yes. Are they somehow related to the camera quality or maybe it's just the screen that is shown? Because for example- They are, when you're buying a phone, what do they say? Oh, this, the camera in front, or the back facing camera is 16 mega pixels, right? You see those numbers? The, f the front facing camera is, I guess, five megapixels or something, which is usually less, actually. Yes, they are. How does that happen when you have different megapixels for the front and then the screen is something else? Is it independent or what? Well, it's independent. So what the, the thing that determines uh, the thing is the lens. The camera not, it's a camera lens. Not what the phone is supposed to show. No. No, so I wish I had, I don't have a selfie camera, but if I, I don't have a selfie picture and I'm not gonna take my selfie right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should. I don't know. Maybe I change it. But if you, is it, is this interesting? Yeah. It depends, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> 
so, so almost, almost all the images that I have in here were taken by this phone, the, the back face, facing camera. And this is like 16 megapixels. And so what you will notice if I, if I, if I attempt to view, if I attempt, if I view the image properties, you will realize that, uh, that in fact you get to see why this is tagged as being 16 megapixels, right? Have you seen this number there? No. I, I can't zoom, it's a pop-up, sorry. Maybe I should copy. I will copy this. And I'm, I'm having trouble copying it. Anyway, uh, so the number up here is, so this is showing you like uh, the, the total number of pixels that you have horizontally by the ones that you have vertical. Usually the vertical ones are almost, uh, it's less than the horizontal one, right? Um, and then this, this would be like your color depth thing we we're talking about. So it's like, uh, I know this uses three channels, so this is 24 bits. And then somewhere here it shows you the total number of pixels and you realize that this number here is exactly the same as this times this. And if you, if you are to kind of like dummy it into um, an equivalent unit, you notice that this is like 16 megapixels. If I was to take a photo from, from this camera here, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, have an image that would have these, these, um, these values here, it would be slightly less. The quality, the quality for the front facing camera at least it used to be far, far lower than the one at the back. But now that everybody's taking selfies, I guess the front facing camera is becoming more important, right? Okay. So you, you, do you understand the computation, how you come up with the size of the image? No. Yes, you do. I said uh, it's, uh, no, it's a total number of pixels. I'm saying if you have an image, right? An image like this. And you're saying you know the total number of pixels that are laid out horizontally and the total number of pixels uh, vertically. You can multiply this value and this value to get the entire number of pixels associated with that particular image. Using that value and your knowledge of um, which color scheme was used to take that photo. So if it's like this, I know it's, uh, it uses the RGB channel, so 24 bits are used to represent each one of these pixels. So the color depth is 24. If I know the total number of pixels, and I know that one pixel has a, is, 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 has a size of 24 bits, I can just multiply total number of pixels times 24 to get what? The size in bits of the image. Once I have the size in bits of the image, then, I mean, I can just do simple computations which we, we looked at last term to, to calculate the bytes, the kilobytes, the, and the megabytes, right? Typically your photos would be would be in megabytes because the range are, these days I guess anywhere between two megabytes all the way up to like, I don't know, X or something, depending on which sort of format you're using. Do you understand this? Now, if you were to, comp sorry? If you were to compute, if you were to compute this, 